conference will now be recorded. This is one of my favorite, uh, my favorite openings, and I always, I always sort of start like this, that as much as we all love dogs, uh, it is science-based. This is not about simply, I love dogs, and now I'm a dog trainer. And so I do want you to know that anything that I say during my presentations, uh, that's based, it comes from a basis of science and research and academics. Uh, when it's anecdotal, I will certainly try and let you know. So some of my favorite expressions are on the screen. You can see that, um, you know, unfortunately, everybody's an expert right now, thanks to social media. So again, always consider your sources. When Heather gave me that great introduction, so I thank her for that. Um, and I just wanted to let you see a little bit more about me. Uh, that's what I do in my spare time when I'm not busy with dogs, uh, although I haven't played in a, in a while because of uh, COVID. But uh, and that's Captain Danger, who's helping me out in the picture. So yeah, you can see about the my background. And um, the IABC, all that means is that I have to stay up to date with current research and science and behavior um, to your benefit. So it's not, again, it's not a certification that you do once and then you're done with it for the next uh, 20 years. It does have to be renewed and you do have to keep up with the science. So I'll try and give you the most up-to-date information that I can. So some of the learning objectives that we're gonna start with in this seminar. Um, I thought that I would touch on, as you can see, four things on the screen. Um, so one of them, the socializing dogs and puppies, that's one that we're gonna be looking at together. Um, another one is uh, the separation, preventing separation anxiety, which is something that we sometimes don't think about uh, until it's too late. Um, finally, preparing for guests again. People will be showing up at our door sooner than later. And as you can hear, there's one of my watchdogs in the background helping me. Very helpful dogs. Uh, and then behavior vaccines. Behavior vaccines are things that you can do and probably should do with your dogs or puppies, regardless of whether or not you think that that's an issue. And we're going to talk more about that um, as we go along. So let's start off. The main tool, when we training when we're working with dogs the main tool that we're going to be relying on primarily is food so i do want to touch on that a little bit because we often get a lot of little hang-ups about food and using food so i i want to talk about that a little bit with you some of the things i sometimes hear when we talk about how to use food uh, my dog's not food driven and, and to a degree, while I certainly understand some dogs may be finicky, the reality is if they weren't food driven, uh, they would expire. So yes, they are food driven, but it's a matter of how do I cultivate that. One of the recommendations that I will say is to make sure that you are leaving the food down all the time. Make sure you are picking it up. So if they don't eat it after about 20 minutes or so, um, pick it up. Right? They can have it later. Again, some of you are parents, so please don't worry. They're not going to starve themselves. Uh, you've all had that kid at the dinner table say, I hate what we're we having. And you've said, well, that's too bad, kitten. Love you. I guess I'll see you tomorrow morning then. And so that's sort of the same thing with your dogs. The reality is when we talk about positive training uh, and resources and that sort of thing, you're not talking, as I often say, about shoving hot dogs in their face all day long, constantly. The way that we use positive, the positive training is based is simply about controlling resources. And food is one of my strongest resources. So I teach them how they can earn good things. Now, what I do want you to think about with your food is you want to use your better stuff for the harder situations. And we're going to talk about that as we go along tonight. So my high value food, my treats, I'm not using that during the day. I'm not using that in all situations. So that's why you often will see, and we're gonna be talking more about this, using food, uh, using meals more for training. When we talk about setting the dog up to succeed, always please be aware 
of these underlying factors. If your dog is anxious, if they're tired, if they're overstimulated, they're not going to be trainable at that moment. And one of the lines that trainers hear a lot from some from students is he knows this, right? You all know that. You've had somebody with a dog that's jumping on you and they're saying, sit, sit, Fido, sit. And then the owner says, he knows this, right? And we want to say, well, obviously he doesn't know it at that moment, but okay, maybe he does. But why doesn't Fido know it at that moment? Is he being bad? Is he stubborn? Is he dominant? No. Um, what's happening in that situation, right, is overexcitement, right? There's other resources there. There's people. There's, there's attention. There's all kinds of other things happening. And so it's not that he's being bad. It's that he simply just cannot focus at that moment. He's not in training mode, so to speak. Um, so let's look at what some of the other lines that we sometimes hear. The food is a bribe. I love this one. I, I do. I love when people uh, say that to me, the food is a bribe, because I'm assuming that when they work, then they're working pro bono, right? I assume they don't get paid for work. Um, and I assume that their spouse has never had to buy them flowers or give them a compliment, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so basically, the food is nothing more than a tool. Please don't give it any value or any more power than it has. It's simply a tool. It's no different than using a leash or a collar. So if you're saying to me that I'm willing to use a collar to control the dog, then my suggestion would be why wouldn't you simply use food and stop trying to overpower the dog, want to let the food do the work for you. So the food is just a tool. It's not about bribery. It's simply about getting a return for the investment. Here's the other way to think about it. You're going to feed them anyway. You are going to have to buy food for them. You may as well get something back for your investment. And that's what I often suggest. Just like you, I have tons of free time during the day to train. So I'm going to be realistic with you when we talk about training. I don't expect you to train 20 minutes a night. Uh, no one's doing that. And, you know, again, if anybody thinks they are with their little spreadsheets, those are also the ones who are hanging their laundry on the exercise bike by the third week. So when we talk about I don't have, always have time to train or do all this stuff, I'm going to give you the lazy person's way to look like a genius. And that's what this is. So one of the big tricks that I will tell you to do is always wear kibble in the house wear meals all the time if you're not feeding if you're not using kibble then figure out a way that you can use some other components of their meals if you can wear that so as soon as you get up as soon as you get up in the morning try to make sure that you have food in your pocket all the time and there's a lot of reasons i tell you to do that um, one of the reasons is about what we call desensitizing it so part of the reason I tell people to wear food all the time is simply because that way the dog learns just because I have food, it's not always available, right? Don't bother me. Don't, so they don't become one of those little dogs that's a piggy as soon as they see somebody with food. So I want the dogs to learn, yes, I have food. It's not always available. So make sure you have some manners for me, please. Another reason that I want you to wear food all the time, and this is where we get into the lazy person's way to look like a genius. Many of you have what I call real dogs. So I have bulldogs. I have little flat-faced furniture with feet. So my dogs, as they say, it takes them four hours to notice I'm gone and another four to care. So I do not have these real sporting, athletic, smart dogs like you guys do. But you can use this to your advantage. And one of the reasons that I really want you to think about wearing food all the time is because you can let the dog train themselves. And this is one of the biggest skills that I would encourage you to really try and get a lot better at, is not telling them what to do. Don't give them commands all the time get much better at noticing 
catching, good choices. For some of you who are sitting here listening to me yell at you, your dogs may be with you right now. What are they doing? Are they being good? Are some of the dogs being good? Are they chilling out? Are they being calm? If you have food on you, you can reward that calmly. You could pay them for that. And the more you pay them, the more you catch those choices, the more the dog will train themselves. So in other words, when we talk about, I love saying this to big correction types of trainers, which is I want the dog to learn that they can control you. And I know that that may sound anathema to many people, but when I say I want the dog to learn how to control me, absolutely. Yes, you can make me pay out, figure out how, because the more they figure out what it is they need to do to get me to pay out, the more they will offer me good behavior and think it's their idea. So the other advantage of wearing food, it lets you train whenever you want. I've seen clients on the weekend with three kids, with two kids. They're not going to have a lot of spare time to train. So wearing kibble lets them do a quick five-minute session or 30 seconds worth of sits or downs in between, right, while they're just waiting for the kids to come down for dinner. So it lets you train whenever you want. When it talk about counter-conditioning noises, and we're going to be getting into this a little bit later, Counter conditioning, that's just a really fancy word phrase for changing emotions. So when we counter condition noises, all that means, especially the young dog or a dog that's new to you, or now that the seasons are changing and you have the windows open more, anytime you hear a noise, anytime you hear sounds outside or a sudden noise in the house, toss cable at them. That lets you set up right from the get go an association of, oh, there's noise, I should be calm, instead of learning to feed off of that and to respond to it. For some of you, you've got dogs that may be hard on your hand taking food. So there are a few tricks that we use for that. The squeeze tubes that you see there, these are available on Amazon, they're available in different places. Uh, these can be very useful tools. So when puppies, especially when they're teething or they get overly excited, uh, we use squeeze tubes and you can put cheese Whiz or peanut butter or you can mix canned food with water to make more of a paste that you can use in the tubes. This is great for things like healing or you want to sustain behavior or even for kids to work with dogs because sometimes what happens is it's a cycle. If the kids are afraid that the dog is going to grab the food, they yank it away. And when they yank the hand away, you make the dog jump up and try and grab more. So that's what the tubes can do. It gives them a way to feed the dog without causing the dog to jump up at them. Another trick that we also use at our school at Burlington is the long shoehorns that you can get from Ikea or perhaps dollar stores. Those are great for teaching heel with little dogs. So if you've got a smaller dog and you want to save your back, you can use one of these shoehorns and you can put cream cheese or same thing, peanut butter, that sort of thing in it. Finally, the cream cheese hand, all that means is that you would take cream cheese or peanut butter or that, and what you would do is put it on the inside knuckle of your first finger. So if you think about making an okay sign with your hand, you would put the peanut butter or cream cheese on the inside of that first knuckle. Then when you reach to the dog, you want to make your hand look as though you're holding a treat, but you don't have a treat in the hand. You're simply letting them lick off the side. The reason we use this is because when you do this setup, this will teach the dog that when a hand comes to them that looks like it has something, they should lick first instead of biting at it. We also do really recommend, and I didn't go further on this here, never say gentle, never teach a dog the word gentle. The reality is that just presenting your hand with treats should automatically mean gentle. We know somebody who had a dog and the dog put three stitches in somebody else's hand because they didn't know they had to say that word. So there should not be a word it should be automatic. And if you go to hand them a treat and they yank it or they're too hard, you may do the uh-uh and take it away. 
So let's try some of that. The food is something that you work for. You have to run out and buy it and spend money for it. So you may as well get a good return on your investment. Now, this is some examples here. These are some examples of some of the higher value food and the food toys that I recommend. So the high value treats, when I'm training myself, I use predominantly human food. I don't use a lot of dog treats. Um, I just find, to be honest, I want to spend my money on myself. So rather than spending a lot of money on expensive treats, I can buy hot dogs. We use those little President's Choice meatballs or frozen meatballs that you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, those are a great value. They tend to be about $10 or $11 for a big box. And all you do is thaw and use them. So you can just take a few out at a time and thaw them. Make sure you do thaw them. Please do not give your dog a frozen meatball. Uh, again, we want to keep them safe. <laughs> um, up at the top of the screen, on the left, you'll see something called rollover. Rollover is one of the dog treats I will use because it's a, it's a good consistency. It works well. As you can see there, it looks like a little bit of a salami, but it's easy to cut up and use for training. Over on the right, one of our instructor's favorite foods is Spam. Um, they did a study that was done with over 200 treats, and Spam came out number one. Now, like I said, I, I, again, I'm horrified by it. I'm always afraid of what I'm going to find when I open the can. But it is a treat that can be used, and it's workable. And what you can do with it is you can slice it up and then microwave it, where it will dry out so it's easier to use for training. Or it's very good to help with stuffing and putting in bones or kongs. Now, when you see the, some of the stuff on the screen here, some of the ideas for treats, you also see some of the things that you can put treats in. So what I recommend, my favorite three are on here. So I really love, they call it the, the busy buddy, it's called a twist and treat. Pardon me, it's that purple clam that you see that little dog carrying. I love this thing. They see, they tend to hold up well, they're not, overly expensive. I don't use them for kibble, despite what the pictures will show you. I put uh, canned food or yogurt or things like that, and then I freeze the bottom half. You can put the top on, and you can make it either as tight or as loose as you want. So it's a great treat, great toy to use that you can make it easier or harder to get the stuff out of, and it comes apart for washing. I love it. They hold up well. The other two that you see that were made by Nylabone, they finally figured out that they should make hollow products. So the hoof is one at the bottom, and then on the right you'll see the stuffed bone or the hollow bone. I really like these products as well. Um, they can be a little bit more expensive initially, but they will last you forever, and they're great for stuffing. Throughout the presentation, you will hear me talk about using stuffed bones. This can be anything that is stuffed with food that keeps the dog busy. When I talk about a stuffed bone, I want you to think of that in terms of the doggy's iPad. So for some of you who have had kids or have children, um, when you go to the restaurant now, you see more and more the parents, they plop them in the chair and they put the iPad in front of them, right? Or the guests come over, give them the iPad. So in other words, that's what a stuffed bone is. It is let your kid watch the movie Frozen for the 900th time while you do your thing. And so when we talk about stuffed bones, it can be a Kong, it can be a bone, it can be anything. Um, treat balls are another one I don't have up on the screen. When I talk about mixing kibble with treat dirt, it is exactly what it says there. Just crumble up some treats, throw it in a baggie with the kibble, and that often will give your kibble a better hit. So when we talk about stuffing, what am I going to use my stuffed bones, right? What am I going to do with those? So that poster on the, on the left-hand side is an example of some of the things that you can use for stuffing. Uh, because I have bulldogs, I'm not as much of a fan of using Kongs for stuffing. I don't like them. I find that they just, they get frustrated. And the dogs get frustrated, and then they just want to quit. So... 
what I find instead is I tend to use the, the hollow bones like you saw or the other things. But I do like Kongs as treat dispensers. So the way I would use Kongs is I will dump some kibble in there uh, and some treat dirt, and then maybe I'll put some peanut butter or yogurt over the opening and then freeze it. And so that way the dogs can lick the opening, they can get the items out of there, but it's still then they're able to get the food out of the Kong more easily once they start rolling it around like a treat ball. Uh, the one and how, when are you gonna use these stuffed bones? The stuffed bones, as I often say at our school, these will save your sanity. So I really recommend strongly, ha always have two or three bones sitting in the freezer at any given moment. The reason I suggest freezing them is simply because they may last longer. Um, and so when will we use them? You can see this, when a guest comes over. Again, just like you would expect your kids to be polite or mind their business or go play a game, that's the exact same thing I would like my dog to learn is here, go have a bone and relax, watch a movie. Um, we can use those things on walks. We can use stuffed bones on walks for loud noises, for teaching a heel, or high value treats for when things come up to us or startle them. Um, sitting out in the backyard. Uh, this is one of my ones that I give my clients at the behavior consult. When I, when I go into the home to meet with them, one of the things they get is a, about a 30 page, 40 page uh, manual that includes in the first part, the bullet point notes, but then some more in depth recommendations. The backyard is almost always included. One of the problems I think that we do with dogs is we tend to put them out in the backyard and then we tell them go have fun and we leave them alone or we ignore them. And so then they go have fun and they start barking at the fence or they start digging up our azaleas and then we get mad at them. And so they're like, well, you said to have fun, I had fun. Well, what do you want me to do? And that's the emphasis throughout our presentation, throughout the work. It's always about setting them up first. What do you want them to do rather than trying to fix it? And so in the backyard, really encourage you, if you're gonna be out there hanging out, bring them out and give them bones, right? Give them treat balls, feed them meals so they start to learn the backyard doesn't mean run and bark at things. Maybe it means let's just go chill out. And finally, in the separation anxiety, we always leave them with stuffed bones or treat balls. You always wanna make sure you're leaving your dog with something really high value to distract them. So let's get into some of the socializing issues. When we talk about socializing with dogs, I wanna to touch on a few key points around this. So first, uh, what is socialization? When we talk about socializing, everybody throws that word around. We have socializing. What is it? Socializing in and of itself, it is a controlled, positive, or at least neutral exposure it is not just willy-nilly running and exposing them to everything you can find unless you are consciously making an effort to make sure that those are positive interactions. If you simply throw them in the deep end without taking the time to make sure that the dog is making a positive and happy association with that, you run the risk of it going the other way and creating substantial fear issues. So socialization is extremely controlled exposure. It is also ongoing. Yes, the critical ages for socialization begin really at birth, as much as I'll say three to 14 weeks. And there are sensitive periods that go up to seven months. But if you just adopted a dog who's two years old, and perhaps he's come from somewhere rural and you live in downtown Toronto. So you're not socializing per se because those windows are closed, but you are now practicing and controlling positive exposures for him to allow that dog to become more used to city sounds, city no noises. I'm always amazed with my clients how much city dogs have gotten used to. It amazes me walking down the street, the sounds of things that happen that their dogs couldn't care less about. I would be wearing my dog on my head if half of those noises happened with him around. So the critical ages and the window 
about three to 14 weeks are extreme sensitive periods. You really need to expose them. The reason I do want to touch on this very quickly, if you're buying a puppy, if you're getting a puppy from a breeder, you should be asking that breeder what they are doing for socialization work until you get the dog. There is a substantial period there where the breeder must be doing work. They must be doing exposure. They should be doing things like different surfaces or perhaps introducing crating, all different types of things, kids, for example. So you do want to be aware of that. And please, once they've had a set of vaccines, certainly the mother has conferred some immunity. And once they've had at least one set from the breeder, please make sure you are getting them out into as many environments as you can. If they haven't had two full sets, you have concerns. Avoid places where there are a lot of dogs. So in other words, don't necessarily take a 10 week old puppy into PetSmart. Uh, I don't wanna go to a dog park. I don't wanna go where there may be a lot of dogs coming in that are not as controlled. But where do you want to take them? Downtown Toronto, um, Staples, go to the bank. Make sure you are getting them out as much as you can early on. When we talk about socialization, the deal is not about quantity, it is about quality. And that's really important. It's not about how much you're doing. It's about the quality of the exposure work when you were doing it. Um, things will last for a long time if you do them right. If you can create some positive exposures, and even with my own dogs, I have that here where I have my bulldog, Louis the Lump Roast, and he loves kids, absolutely loves kids. I do not have kids. I, I'm not, they're not going to drop out of the sky anytime soon for me. Uh, and he's not around kids a lot with me. So why does he like children? Why is he so good with them? Because the breeder did a lot of careful controlled exposure with their grandkids and her kids. And so he's had a lot of prior exposure. And so that early exposure with the kids, that quality was enough to make him really solid. He loves kids. And so don't think so much about the idea of quantity. It's absolutely about simply taking care to make sure that it's a quality experience for the dog. So how do you create how do you create that really positive association? So one of the things we use, remember, we're going to go back to those high value treats. So the high value treats for the dog um, is, again, whatever to that dog, the dog is, says, oh, my Lord, what is this and how do I get more of this? So that's where I need to have my heavy hitter treat. Remember I said to you back in those other slides, um, I talked to you a little bit about how to use food. So around the house, I said, most of my work is kibble. But when I go outside, um, when I go outside with them, when I'm in difficult environments, that's when I'm going to, now I'm going up. Now I'm going to the meatballs. Now I'm going steak. Now I'm going to go to that chicken, right? Now I'm going up. And that's where you want to think about how to, how and where and when to use your food. So when you are trying to create that good association, you are going to either hand the treats or toss them to the dog when the trigger shows up. So let's say you're outside and somebody comes up to your dog and says, oh, that's a cute dog. Can I see him? Just that experience of having someone suddenly approach him, you would be feeding. You would first feed your dog. Yay. Someone came up to us. Cool. Now, how do you know how far away to work? Did the dog eat? If your dog eats, that means you're probably working at an appropriate level. So you're probably doing great. If they don't eat or they start taking the food really hard, that means you're too close. Get out. You're good. They're about to fail. And that's also why we use food because it's a really good barometer for us of how far away, how is my dog doing? So when they remember we said in that first slide or second or third, when they're stressed, when they're anxious, when they're fearful, they're not going to be able to train. Quit early and often. This is one of my favorite mantras when it comes to dog training. 
Okay. This is not not the idea to run. Do not feel that you need to push through adversity. You always want to quit on a good note. And it's way more often than not uh, that we end up sabotaging ourselves because we have a really good session and then we end up going too long and the dog cries. So as much as you can, you want to quit early, quit often. The safety bubble. Uh, this is something that we just talked with our students this week about at our scholars classes. One of the very important things with dogs in general on leash that I often say is you do not let people or dogs come to them on the leash. If they're going to say hi to something, they need to be able to control the interaction. So if somebody comes to you and says, oh, may I say hi to the dog? Your answer is, yeah, can you wait, please, if your dog is friendly? And then you're going to turn to the dog and ask Muffin if she wants to go say hi to them. If Muffin approaches them, great, they can say hi. If Muffin avoids them, just tell the person, oh, yeah, he has fleas. Sorry, I forgot to mention that, and leave. Any time your dog backs away from something or they avoid somebody, praise them. You can even reward and just walk away, just leave. It is really important that the dog learns that backing away or avoiding will work to diffuse a situation. And that's a very, very important concept to remember. And when they are backing off, when they're backing off, when they're leaving things alone, you want them to learn this is how you can keep safe. So if they were to back off and you still allowed that person to come to them, that's when they begin to learn they're not safe and then they are going to start to escalate and you may get into aggression. If you look at these pictures, these three, they're from one of my other seminars that I do on body language. And so the one up on the top left, you can see that Rottweiler, that's owned by one of our trainers, and she was a wonderful dog, and she loved kids. She was actually very good with kids. She was a fabulous girl. But even in that picture, that's not a setup. Uh, because the girl is leaning in very closely to her, the dog is trying to avoid. So the dog is not comfortable there. And that's because the girl has been allowed to go in and to invade the dog's space rather than the dog going to the person. In the other two pictures, the body language, you can see with the children at the bottom left, how the dog is avoiding. The dog is not engaging with those kids at all. The leash is straight. The dog is turned away from them. Um, that's, again, another indicator of discomfort. Right? And the problem with being on the leash is the dog can't get away. And at some point when they learn they're not safe, they learn that they may have to resort to aggression. Be creative. So again, remember I said to you, we don't have kids. They're not going to drop out of the sky is my understanding about how they get made. Um, so for example, when we get puppies, one of the things that I do is I do, we do stuff like taking them around schoolyards, around playgrounds, to be around kids playing. So they get comfortable with seeing that. Um, what else don't you have? Try and be aware of that and really address it. Another example, and some of you, because this is geared towards the Oakville Milton area, although it may be, I think we've got people from far, far away, as far as I understand, which is great. If you're in a rural area, then especially the young dog, you really should try and make an effort to get downtown in the city at least once a month with them. Right? Be careful about all these things that you may run into later and we don't think about it. So some of the examples you see there are things like schoolyards, playgrounds, um, skateboard parks. Right? Because the great thing about a skateboard park is it lets you work far enough away where the dog is comfortable. You're not being startled by the skateboards. You're far enough away where your dog can eat so they can see them successfully. Um, parking lots are a good one to get the chance just to see vehicles moving. Um, sporting fields, right? Kids playing games. How far away do I have to be to get the dog to eat easily? Uh, commuter train stations. This is one I often recommend, the GO station. It's one of my favorite go-to, with no pun intended, uh, exercises for people, especially people who have very friendly dogs or even shy dogs. It can go either way. 
the reason I love working there is I often say is go to a go station at rush hour and just sit on a bench, hang out, give your dog a bone, and just do some tree tossing when people go by. The reason I say this is that the nice thing with a go station or commuter is that because people are dressed for work, they're far less likely to engage you and the dog. So for people who have these very social, you know that, those little dogs that are flinging and jumping every time they see somebody, they're trying to go greet them. This is a great setup to begin to work on manners so they learn just because you're around people, you're not greeting everybody. We don't say hi to people. For the shy dogs, it's a really good setup to work on so that they learn to feel safer because you're less likely to have people coming over trying to interact with the dogs. So that's where I say I love the commuter places. Bike paths are another one. Finally, one of the, the other points is go to school. Right? As we say, be cool, go to school. Um, the Oakville Milton Humane Society, they have some great classes. They've got some great individuals. They've actually got some very, very uh, skilled trainers and behavior people there. And they do classes. They can also give you some referrals for certain areas if you're looking for a trainer. I just want to touch a little bit more on this because it's really important, this concept of going to classes. Um, why do you want to go to group classes, even if you think you know what you're doing? Um, it's for the exposure work. It's not as much about knowing whether or not you can make your dog sit. It's working with your dog in an environment with people and dogs around so that they learn when there are these distractions, you pay attention to me. And the other thing I will say to you as a Jewish grandmother, which I get to do, is you don't know what you don't know. So be careful about the I've trained dogs before. I don't need to go to classes. I, I will guarantee you that you will learn at least something kind of fun or new if you find the right school. The American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior has a handout that I give clients sometimes of how to choose a trainer. And I'm not going to spend a long time on this one, but it gives you an idea of what should you be looking for. When you're looking for a trainer, what should you be looking for? And so one of the things that you want to make sure is that they are reward or positively based training. Um, you want to be careful about things that talk about, use words like dominance or pack leaders, any of that sort of thing, um, because there may be people who are just simply not current and they're not up to date and they're more likely to use force, especially with dogs that may be fearful because they perceive behavior to be challenging to them rather than respecting that the dog is simply having a hard time. Um, you do want people who are respectful of you. I've had any number of clients where the trainer may be very knowledgeable, um, but they've had bad experiences because they felt that they were treated like idiots. So, you know, yes, certainly this is my field of expertise. And when I go in for a consult, when I'm working with people, I may not be working with clients who have the same degree of expertise in this very specific field. But that doesn't mean they don't know their dogs better than I do. And it's very important that I respect them and I respect the work they've done prior or their knowledge and what they bring to the table. So this is absolutely a partnership and you should feel at least respected. Um, always sit in on a class if you're not sure about a school. Any good school will permit you to come and watch a class. Now, right now, because of COVID, there may be, that may be harder to do. And I know at our school, personally, we're extremely conscious of maintaining spacing and numbers. So it may not be an option right now, but as things open up and there are more vaccines, that should become, again, a viable option. Remember, there's no guarantees. If anybody tells you of a trainer, or an organization, there's certainly an organization out there I know of uh, that claims to do behavior stuff and they claim to do guarantees. That they guarantee they will fix it, uh, you know, or they keep coming back in perpetuity, which they rarely do. There's no such thing. So anybody who says that they guarantee you they can fix it uh, is a bit of a red flag to me. You know, we're all individuals, so are the dogs. So we will work together uh, with your trainer, but be aware of that, right? We're all, they're all living beings. Uh, make sure they're being safe. Okay? Make sure they're keeping, keeping the client safe and ask how they deal with problems. When you sit in on a class, what should you be looking for? 
you want to make sure you've got enough room to work safely. Um, I talked to somebody, one of my other clients I saw recently with a dog that is can be friendly with dogs, but she's a little bit nervous. And she didn't do well in the classes. And as we talked about it, it turned out that they had dogs sitting almost virtually right beside them during classes. And so the dog was almost surrounded by dogs. So it was not able to be successful in that scenario. Um, there should be a pretty good teacher-student ratio. You want to make sure that you're not going to go into a school where they're going to have 20 people in a room with one or two instructors. So you want to make sure they have enough the teachers that can help people. And watch how they're helping people, right? Are they paying attention to the dogs? Are they making sure that the dogs are safe when people are coming in and out, not just during the class? Um, can you hear, right? Uh, and what do you feel? What's your feeling with working with them, with the staff, with their mannerisms, and the facility itself? This is uh, my dog, Puggy Sue, uh, who felt that she deserved a ribbon because she didn't bite her trainer. So thankfully, no lawsuits here. Separation anxiety. This is one of the uh, sort of the big ones that we're seeing more now thanks to the pandemic and lifestyles that have been changing. This is basically what you're looking at here is a prevention protocol, right? So even if you think your dog is fine, um, you do want to be very care careful about this. So you don't accidentally end up creating a separation dog. So you can see that where it says leave the dog or the puppy alone, you know, for anywhere from an hour, it can be a half hour, it can be four hours but try to make sure you're getting out of the house several days a week. So if you've noticed there happens to be a week where you've been around a lot, then maybe make sure, even I call them the drive-through dates, um, go to McDonald's for dinner and eat in the park a lot. But do make a conscious effort. Be careful, make sure somebody is not with that dog 24 seven. So you really wanna make sure they are being left alone here and there. Um, go out at odd times not just work. So if you do work, if you are still leaving the house to go to work, make sure that you're also leaving the dog alone at night here and there for a couple of hours so that they also get used to those dinner dates that you may have. Uh, I have seen clients with dogs that can handle them going to work, but not if the people leave the house at any other time. Uh, so you do want to make sure you are varying that schedule. When you go out, what are you going to leave them with? So first, always make sure you're leaving them something to do. Uh, normally, what I will say to, to the client is I leave two or three things. So I would suggest leaving them with like a treat ball, uh, for example. So a treat ball can have maybe half a cup of kibble. Um, and then I want to leave them a bone that was refrigerated. So it's stuffed, but it's refrigerated, so it's easy to get to. And then I might leave them with a frozen bone. Now, well, some of you may be hearing this and thinking, oh my God, like I can't give my dog this much food. He's going to be 400 pounds. I often say that you can give your dog eight meals a day. So in other words, what you want to do is get a lot more creative about how you use your food. So when I say to you about giving three items there, I've given you three things that I would leave them with. Let's say I've got my bulldog. And so my bulldog, she's about 50 pounds. And she gets about a cup of kibble twice a day. So when I go out, I could leave her a treat ball with a, a half a cup of kibble and maybe just some little crumbs, some treat dirt. I can leave her a stuffed bone with one teaspoon of canned food in it with some other small things. And I can leave her another bone with another teaspoon. So that's an example of how I'm stretching her meal out. So instead of giving her dinner or breakfast, that would be her meal. Um, and so that's sort of the idea when we talk about leaving them things. When you leave on sounds, we often hear about the leave the radio on or television, which is great. Uh, there was a study that was done with shelter dogs that found that spoken word um, audiobooks they found was actually more calming to the dogs than music. So that's why we say audiobooks, stuff like that. Um, dim the lights, cover the windows. You really want them to chill. The reality is when you go out, they're not having parties. They're not inviting their friends over. It's not about, oh my God, now what will I do? They're going to sleep. They're just going to keep finding comfortable places to nap. So you want to facilitate that chill out. 
I do recommend if it's an option for you uh, to crate them, put them in the basement if that's possible. Um, I like basements. They're number one, they tend to be a bit cooler. They're also quieter, so I don't have to worry about some idiot coming to the door. Uh, or if there's a storm that comes up during the day, at least in a basement area, they may be a little bit more confined, a little more muffled. So if that's an option, that's great. If it's not, do try and be aware that they don't leave them right by large windows, open areas. Again, just in case a storm or something comes through when you're not there. Um, that can be really scary for them. How do you know? When we talk about dogs, or people will say to me, he has separation anxiety, and we say, well, how do you know? Well, you know, he chewed this, or he shredded that. Um, and so when we look at separation, what? how do we know if it's anxiety or boredom? In general, anxiety types of behaviors, you'll see them geared more around entrances and exits. For one thing, so you may have a dog that's gone, and I have seen a dog that's gone through drywall. Um, I actually had one of my clients had a husky. Huskies are remarkably skilled at both separation anxiety and panicking and getting out of the house. And I had one of them who got out a second floor window on Queen Street in downtown Toronto and was standing on the ledge of the building with everybody below waiting to catch the poor thing. He was fine. The owners got home. Somebody notified them. But if the dog, if most of the damage or you're seeing issues around the front, the hallways, the exits, the windows, um, or the things they're chewing are things you've worn or handled. So things like remote controls or shoes, clothing, stuff like that, um, that may be anxiety. That does indicate there may be a little bit of anxiety around your leaving. Um, boredom, the other side of that though is boredom. So if they get into the garbage, um, or if they're chewing, maybe they're chewing the wood furniture um, or things like that. That's not necessarily anxiety. That might just be simply bored and they're just self-amusing. So that's where you kind of want to make sure you can figure out what am I looking at. Now, very obviously, as you can see by this, because I'm sure all my trainer friends are listening to this saying, oh, my God, when is she going to talk about a crate? So I'm going to talk about a crate right now. Um, obviously, yes, I when you go out you should not be leaving them loose um, unless you are absolutely certain that they are completely safe. And even then, um, I am a big crate fan, and it sometimes helps to think of the crate. It's not a dungeon. You do not need to put them in the very basement of the house with bats and spiders. Um, it is a bedroom. It is simply giving your kid their own bedroom, and it's giving them a nice little safe spot and that way, when you're at work, you don't have to worry about, did they get into something? If something happened, they're safe. So obviously, yes, if you're having destruction, the real answer is, why is the kid loose? But these are just some of the examples of how can you tell. What if you've come home and you find a mess after the fact? You come home and you, you find the garbage all over the floor, or they find they've gone to the washroom. Um, what can you do? So the really the, the trainer's solution to this is you roll up a newspaper, uh, hit yourself on the head and say, how did I let this happen? The reality is if you come home to find a mess, there's nothing you can do at that moment that will impact the dog's behavior later. So when you see all these little guilty videos or, you know, he knows, uh, it's not guilt over something they did three hours ago. The behavior that you're seeing in those videos is what we call appeasement. It's fear, right? It's, you know, again, when you were, if you remember when you were young, if your dad came upstairs and he was yelling at you, you didn't have to have done anything wrong. That tone of voice, and you were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. You're like, hi, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're like, what are you apologizing for? I don't know. Just tell me, oh, my God. So that's sort of that same idea. Um, if you come home and they've already done it, you just clean it up, deal with them. Uh, but you can't punish them unless you basically catch them right in the act. And even then, you got to be very careful. Some of the safety tips there are a couple of little tips I just left there. If you have more than one dog, uh, we never leave two dogs alone unsupervised. This is just, again, your Jewish grandmother tip, the safety. It doesn't matter how much they like each other. Um, this is extremely important if you have a size differential. So if you have anything more than about a one-to-one -one size differential, um, they should absolutely never be alone together. 
uh, like I said, regardless of how much they like each other. They are still dogs and things may happen. This is also critical if you have an age differential. If you have a senior dog, they must be kept safe because you can sometimes see with senior dogs when they start to behave oddly or something happens that the other dogs can react and may attack them, um, not because they don't like them, but because they are animals. And uh, you sometimes will see that sort of they're being strange and it's almost a culling of that herd because they will endanger everybody else. The other little tip I'm gonna add here for some of you who may live in condos or apartments, um, is to use make use of webcams or recorders. Uh, I've had clients where they've been responding to barking complaints when it's not their dog. And people are also given to hyperbole. So you do want to be really careful about that. You know, you can get that neighbor that says they're barking all day if you have a video that says he barked four times at 4.30. So it's one of my little suggestions I often make for people in multi-unit multi, multi -unit dwellings is uh, just to cover, you know, cover the bases. So let's talk about guests. Um, so for guests, right, they're going to be showing up again, whether we like it or not, now that everyone has vaccines. So one of the first things with getting ready to have guests over is plan ahead. So when I say to you plan ahead, um, what does that mean, right? Planning ahead means that you want to have a clear idea ahead of time. Uh, what are you going to do, right? In other words, and it's one of the phrases that I use a great deal with my clients as well, I can't do don't. All right, so when people will say, I say, what do you want the dog to do? Well, I don't want him to jump on people. I can't do that. That's too big. I don't want him to speak French. I don't want him to jump on people. I don't want him to play a ukulele. I don't want him to take the car keys. What do you want him to do? Because when you phrase it in terms of the do, that makes it much easier on you. Don't is overwhelming. Do is concrete. So what do you want the dog to do and how will you train it? So I often get those, the people who say, well, I want him to go to his mat and do a wait. And I admire those people. I do. I do. That's what we call idealists <laughs> for me. I don't, I don't know that I want to do that much work, but okay. But if that's what you want, then at least you say, okay, well, how do I train it? Well, I better train that ahead of time before I really have someone here, and then I understand how to work on it. So get a clear picture. What do you want the dog to do? Um, what happens if you don't have dog-friendly visitors? What if I have a contractor? I have somebody who's allergic. I have somebody who's afraid of a dog. Uh, I have kids coming over, right? How are you, how are you gonna manage your dog? Um, like I said, you can hear before, or I've mentioned throughout, is I am a big fan of crates. If you can't use a crate, then teach your dog how to be put away. If that's a baby gated in a bedroom um, or elsewhere. But it is very important. It's like having a kid. There are times where I need the kid to be away and I need them to be safe. And so you do want to think about that. If I have somebody coming over who's afraid of dogs, what can I do? How can I make them feel more, more comfortable? Another thing that I like is tether stations. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So tethering just means you can tie the dog to the couch with you, put a leash on the couch and just sit with them. And that's another way to manage the dog if she, don't, if she can't be loose. The friendly visitors. So if you have a really friendly dog, how are you going to keep visitors from rewarding bad behavior? Because we have all gone through this. Your dog runs to see your your mother-in-law is jumping all over him, and you're saying to your mother-in-law, can you not let her do that? Your mother-in-law says, let's do this together, people. Ready? I don't mind. Right? Well, I do. So how are you going to set that up then? One of the recommendations I often make is that dogs are not loose when doorbells, when people are coming in. And we're going to look at this in a minute, the next couple of slides. But I would suggest put the dog away before people come in. And that lets you really control the guest. Is then you can you're in control of the interactions. Finally, it's what's best for the dog. You want to be careful about this idea that the dog needs to be a part of everything. Um, they don't. And as a parent, your job is to take a look at a situation, regardless of whether or not the kid or the dog is saying they want to be there. 
And it's your job to recognize there may be times where that's not a good situation. They're not going to be comfortable. And for what it's worth, I often say the same thing. When we visit our family, you know, they have dogs or we rarely bring our dog. Uh, and part of that reason is simply because it's not relaxing for me. Even if the dog is good, it's not relaxing. I have to watch the dog. I've got to be aware of what's going on. Um, and some dogs, they may be really anxious or stressed by all the movement and the excitement. So rather than actually forcing the dog to be a part of that, sometimes it just makes more sense to say, go, you're fine. Go hang out in your room. You can have bones or Kongs and chill. So you really want to make sure that you are making the right call that's best for the dog, not for what you or I want. When we talk about management and safety tools, again, crate training is a big one. Um, for small dogs, if you've got little dogs under 20 pounds or so, one of the other tools that I really like, and I, I'm really sorry that while I have the presentation on, I can't see your reactions, because I quite enjoy watching my dog friends wince when I say this. Um, I love doggy strollers. And when I say doggy strollers, I don't mean that you have to be that weird person pushing your dog around on the street with a stuffed dog or beside them. The doggy strollers, the reason I say I love doggy strollers for small dog, because they're such portable crates to be using inside. It's such an easy way to set up, you're gonna eat dinner, Put them in the stroller next to you, give them a bone, there, they're not bothering you. Um, somebody's coming to the house, there, they're in the stroller, I don't have to worry about trying to get people not to pay attention to them. Uh, condos, apartments, getting downstairs safely. So that's another one, but certainly crate train, um, if that's at all possible, crate train or use baby gates, um, and make sure you are putting them away when you're home. That's a really important one, especially for guests. You want to work now to get the dog comfortable with this idea that sometimes we're home and you still will be put away. So one of the examples I use for this is for dinner time. Um, I love dogs. I don't like when they bother me when I'm eating. And so generally our rule here is when we have dinner, our dogs are fed dinner right before us. So everybody goes, gets put away in a crate or in their room. They have dinner, we eat, and then they come out later. So you want to make sure you are putting them away when you're home sometimes so that you get used to being put away when you're around. The airlock on entry do doors, all that means, that's what I call the airlock, I just mean a secondary barrier. So especially if you've got kids in the house, um, take a look at your front door or your side doors. Um, do you have a secondary barrier? to that door. So in other words, that front door, I often recommend, even if you put a baby gate in the hallway or you put up an X pen or you have somebody build, build in uh, a pretty half wall, but be sure that you have a double block on the entry doors to prevent the Murphy's Law moments that will happen. Um, and finally, tether stations. I mentioned that to you before. The tether station, that just means that you're going to be putting the leash on the dog and hooking them. You can hook them to your waist. You can hook them to the furniture with you. Uh, you can also put a little baseboard uh, or a little eye hook in a baseboard. And you can create a little tether station for when you're in the kitchen with them, for example, with a bed. So you can give them a bone and let them be on their bed. Obviously, we would never leave a dog tethered unsupervised. Um, but they can be like an open air crate. It can give you a quick, easy way to just simply limit their access so they don't go running all over the place. Now we talked a little bit about the guests um, and the doorbell. That's a really big trigger, isn't it? Docking or doorbells. The rule in the house here for sure is the door does not open with us until the dog is put away. And we have, we've always had that rule. When people ring the bell, you can wait please. Everybody goes in their spot, then I'm opening a door. I don't open the door until that happens. So uh, in your home, I would suggest a sort of similar strategy. Um, and that will also really help with guests just simply to get control of the situation. Uh, you can see the little sign. I had a client and I, and I felt badly that I didn't get a good picture of it. Uh, but you can have the kids make a really cute sign. And their kids, it was terrific. Yeah, they made a great sign for the dog. That's sort of the whole, the whole list of rules. Please ignore him when you come in. We're working with him. We're training. You know, don't do this. 
but it was a really fun sign. So something even like this, don't ring the bell, or if you ring it, please be patient, we're training. Um, that can be really helpful. This training exercise, the doorbell games, this is an example uh, of one of the exercises that I give my clients in the training book. So when we talk about doing this, the idea is to teach the dog that it, the doorbell means run to the crate for a meatball or go to your spot. So it could be your tether spot on the mat or whatever it is you want. And so you can see the setup here. You send somebody outside where the dog can't see them and you give them a three minute timer. And every time the timer goes off, they, they ring the doorbell and then just sit back down outside. Whenever the doorbell goes off, Yahoo, the person inside gets excited. They run into the crate with a meatball, close the crate for about 15 seconds, open it, and just hang out. After the last repetition, ideally, the first person should try and come in through a different entry. The goal is not only to teach the dog that the doorbell means run to your crate. The goal is also to teach them that not everybody is coming in a door when you hear that noise. That sound doesn't always mean people are coming in. We're gonna get into a little bit um, of behavior, what I call the behavior vaccine. So you're doing great and I really appreciate you're staying awake with me so far and I'm thinking you have, I'm hoping you have. So I'm hoping when I go back to the screen that I'll see some of you. One of the most dangerous phrases that we use with dogs um, is the word fine. He's fine, he's fine with X, Y, Z. So when we talk about this phrase, he's fine with that. I want you to be very, very careful. Um, when people say he's fine with something, that generally means that the dog is simply not actively ripping the person's head clean off their body. Um, just because your dog doesn't look like they're reacting does not mean they're fine. And that's the point of doing these behavior vaccines, which you'll see in a minute. So things like dogs that are barking. One of the rules in our school and my clients uh, across the board, anytime you hear a dog bark on the planet, and I'll leave the on the planet, literally. So this can be television. It might be a backyard. It might be another dog in the house. Um, anytime you hear a dog bark anywhere, immediately feed your own dog. That is one of the techniques that we use so that your dog doesn't start to learn to feed off of that. They don't react to it. And for some dogs, it's scary, right? It's alarming. So they also learn that that's cool. I'm eating, that's fun. It's not a terrifying thing. Um, the things like thunderstorms, fireworks, this is a really big one also. The problem with sound phobias is those are ones that very often really kick into high gear later. That's one of the big problems. A dog may appear to be fine when they're a puppy, when they're one, when they're three years old or so, four years old, but all of a sudden you get to five, six, seven, and all of a sudden we start to see these really terrified reactions to storms or noises. So you really want to work on that now, even if you think they're fine. We want to do a lot of food work around those storms. We want to make sure they're safe. Um, and being outside with them, that's why I said to you, when you go outside, you always have your highest value food outdoors. So when you're outdoors, that's going to be the meatballs, the chicken, right? So any noises, right? A sudden motorcycle, a car, a kid riding a bike, a skateboard. What else can you think of if you think about your walks? What might be scary? So that's where we talk about this phrase, fine. And so finally, the behavior vaccines that I was referring to. So when we talk about behavior vaccines, the don't wait till it's too late. This is some of the fun psychology games that you can play that you can do with your dog to create a really strong foundation now so that you're not trying to fix it later. Um, so feeding meals. If your dog likes their meals, feed them anywhere but home. Right? Don't feed them in the house, feed them everywhere. Feed them in the driveway, right? When the kids are coming home from school, feed them in the driveway and bring them back in the house. Um, feed them in the backyard. When you're outside, when the other dogs are barking somewhere, Go to a parking lot, feed them a meal, um, feed them during storms, feed them in their crates, in the car. 
The reason we do the feed the meal and then just bring them back in, that's about simply desensitizing. One of the big issues with dogs on leash, which we're not addressing as much here tonight, but is the fact that we simply disengage. We very often with the leash, we put the leash on and it's like the backyard. It's the go do your own thing. And so the leash starts to cue excitement. As soon as the leash goes on, they start getting ramped up. They're like, woohoo, I'm going out. I'm going to find things to yell at, look at, and holy crap. And so when we do the feed a meal and come back in, that's a little bit about trying to modulate that emotion so that your dog doesn't always become a screaming, twirling idiot as soon as they get outside. Um, when do you give them treats? When you use them food? We've said this, right? Whenever a dog barks anywhere, um, you hear a doorbell, right? The doorbell rings. Cool, there's a doorbell. Toss treats. Any animals on television. Television is one of those big ones um, you want to be careful with. The flat screens are much easier now for the dogs to really see. And so that's sort of becoming one of my new window problems um, where the dogs will see things or they hear them. So we do a lot of treat toss if they notice stuff there. Um, when do you want to put them away with bones, right? When you're eating dinner. If you simply set that up, that every time you eat dinner, they are in the, they're in their crate with a bone. The more you do that, the more they will start to default to, oh, they're eating dinner, I guess I have to go to the crate. Cool, right? We often say put them away when the guests are coming in and when they're leaving. Those are both really hard times for dogs, regardless of how well they're doing. When guests are leaving or coming in, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of excitement, and there's also very tight space, right? People are hugging, you're in the hallway, it's all very close, uh, and it's a recipe for disaster. So generally, put the dog away when people are coming in. Put them away when you're leaving. Um, planning ahead. Remember, we talked about this a little bit earlier. What do you want doorbells to mean? Uh, what do you want storms to mean? Right? What are you going to do if an elderly parent is visiting you? What if you go to a cottage where somebody's coming with a dog? And this is a really great example because the cottages are starting up again. Um, and it's hard. To have a family member, their dog may not be appropriate, and it's very hard when they may or may not be on top of that, right? My dog's fine. I'll just have them loose, even if their dog should be wearing an orange jumpsuit and serving time. So plan ahead for that. If you're going to go to a cottage, then I would say to you very much, really try and work on crate training ahead of time so that you do have the ability to put your dog away when you get there and when they get put away, they're being put away somewhere nice and comfortable and somewhere they're familiar. Um, the other one, again, what should you bring with you, right? So when you go to cottages and stuff, other than just behaviorally, uh, what do you also plan for? Benadryl, things like that. So this is all about the whole plan ahead, whether it's behavior or anything else. Um, if you're planning ahead, you're much less likely to get ambushed. Finally, the last point I want to make before I uh, before we switch back over to the, the Q&A and I can shut this down, um, and I didn't touch on it as much here, is what we call barrier frustration. So please do make sure that your dogs are not looking out the windows. Make sure they're not looking at fences. Um, that's called barrier frustration. And that can often trigger uh, leash reactivity, leash aggression. So we, we don't want dogs looking out windows. So be aware of that at home. That's another one. If there's windows where they can see out, you can sit with them and give them a bone. You can give them treats. But you want to make sure they're not rehearsing things that you don't want. I really want to thank you um, for sitting through this, for staying awake with me and taking the time to go through it. Um, I was able to wrap just a little bit early. And what I'm going to do now is I'll take the presentation off uh, so I can take a look at some of the individual questions and we can try to hit some of those. Okay, so now we've gone to the stop sharing. So now I get to, oh, I get to see faces again. Um, that's great. Okay, and now I also have there we go. I can also see the chat, so I can address some of the questions as uh, Heather or um, as you you guys uh, 
see fit. Is there anything you wanted me to address? Um, but first of all, thank you so much for that informative and very practical presentation. I know that we're going to be able to apply uh, what you've shared with us in real life as we return to work, school, and our busy lives. So a couple of questions that we have had is, um, at the beginning you were talking about food and using food to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Um, what do you recommend for a dog with allergies when you want a high level treat if you don't have the option of kibble being that? So some of the options, when you have dogs with diets that are limited in that way, um, I talked about that idea of treat dirt, again, mixed in with their food. So whatever food you're using for that dog, double check to see what the protein is being used. So very often you can do some workarounds with allergies if you can find out what the protein is in the food. So it may be a, a lamb-based food or maybe a duck-based food. Another option is to get canned food. If you can get canned food of the same manufacturer, um, the canned food, especially in pate, you can often slice it and you can throw it in the oven at 250. You can bake it and you can make cookies out of it. And that's a really good one that you can often work around. We do that with the gastro food from the vets a lot. Um, if there's an allergy issue or if they're on the gastro food and gastro works well for that. So you can bake cookies out of it. Um, yeah, the key is to be really creative because you also may find with allergies that you can use a very small amount of crumbs of something that's a little bit tastier to mix in with the regular food that you're using and to get more creative with that. Perfect. Um, what uh, do you do when you have a dog that isn't food motivated? Um, in general, like we touched on in the beginning, in general, the dog is not foodie. Um, because they all have to have food to live. So if the dog's not food motivated, a couple of things you want to look at is, um, number one, you want to double check how much are you feeding them a day. Um, sometimes it may simply be that we're giving them a lot of food as part of their regular diet. And so they're just simply not overly motivated because they're, they're full. Um, another one may be is changing flavors. Uh, most stores, they all have samples. They just don't tell you about it because people steal them. Um, so mm -hmm. most stores will, they do have samples. And so you can go to the store, ask them for samples. If you have a dog that's not foody and you can try some different flavors for them. Um, the, the other issue with if they're not uh, food motivated, a couple of things, obviously I will say to you is always do a rule out with your vet to make sure there's not something else going on. Um, sometimes when we think, oh, he's just not foodie or he's picky, when you get into that further with the vet, it's sometimes you sometimes learn that they may be having a GI issue or a stomach issue. So you do want to make sure that you do a rule out with your vet if you've got a dog that's not overly foodie. Um, and the last one is experiment with the higher value food. Uh, very often, if you go back to what I said before, very often when people say to me, the dog's not foodie, They've been trying basic dry treats or perhaps, um, you know, sort of standard dog treats. So really experiment with some of that human stuff to find out if there's something out there that your dog may end up saying, you know, mother of God, what is this and how do I get more of this? <laughs> Great. Um, do you feel that access to the owner all the time while we work from home has increased the likelihood that dogs will experience separation anxiety when we go back to work? Yeah, um, I think, yes. I mean, I, I think, and I want to be careful about a couple of things on this. Um, it, it really is like anything. It's sort of like with parenting as well, as much as we love our kids. Uh, the reality is that they get older, that, that we do need them to learn, go to a sleepover, you're going to be fine, you're not going to die, I'll see you in two days, okay? Um, and so the same idea, that's what we said earlier on, if you find you're around a lot with a dog, you really do need to make a conscious effort here and there during the day, either put them down for a nap in another room for a few hours while you're working, or make sure that you are going out, because yes, you're right, 
for any number of reasons. If the dog goes from three months of <clears throat> constantly having somebody in the house, and then all of a sudden the next week, they're left alone for eight hours. That's gonna be very difficult, um, even for a dog that's not anxiety prone, simply because it's such a startling change in schedule and environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... For someone who has an adopted dog, uh, that when they try to leave the room, uh, the dog urinates, and so what they're hoping for is how would you break down, like what would you consider the baby steps to get to the point where you can actually leave the dog alone, generally speaking? Yeah, so if, you, if you've got a dog with that substantial of a separation issue, whether that worry, um, one of the first things that you would do is I would suggest we start you'd start working with a baby gate uh, with the dog. And so all you would start with is just simply sit on the other side of the gate. So you'd sit right next to the dog. Start working with having the gate between you. And then what you would simply do is every time you stood up to leave, you would toss a handful of little kibbles or treats, toss a handful, step out of the room, come back in. And so you do some micro hits of simply working on just the initial process of leaving the dog. Because very often, especially with separation dogs, very often it's that first half hour that's your hardest point. Once I get through the first half hour, I'm often fine. It's that first half hour. And so what you're describing is a sort of just in a microcosm. It's the first you know, minute. But it very likely with that dog, if you can get the dog refocused even in the first couple of minutes, a dog may be okay for a little bit longer. It may be a, a response to the person getting up in the first place. There's a lot of factors there. But I would do the small hits of having a gate between you to start and then gradually increase some distance and toss treats, leave, come back in. What happens in the situation where um, you have a dog that is, say, over aroused and barking instead of choosing to um, accept chewing on one of those bones or food dispensers that you have spoken of? Yeah, so I think, again, um, it goes back, I think, the one slide where we said if they won't eat, um, or if they're not eating easily, it means you're over their head. So if the dog is they won't work on the bone. Uh, say you've got a guest over and the dog will not redirect on the bone, they're just barking, barking, barking. Um, so a couple of things. It may be that maybe instead of having the crate, maybe that's a dog you try tethering with you. Maybe they'll be functional if they're on the couch next to you in the room with their bone, with the person. Or maybe it's a situation where they really need to be the other way. They need to be out so they can't hear the people. So. You know, there's not the concrete answers with each dog, um, like with kids. We need to find that spot of where are they going to be functional. So, And we also need to look at why they're barking. Um, remember, dogs don't bark. They, they don't do things just to be jerks. You know, as much as, you know, you hear people saying that. Um, I know you love your dogs dearly. They're really not that deep. Okay, they're not doing stuff just to try and establish something with you. If they're barking, they're having a hard time. And so as a parent, I want to figure out what is the problem? What is causing this for you? Why are you barking and how can I help you? Um, very often also with some dogs, it may be simply eye contact. People stare. People look at them. They're rude. And so it may be as simple as you put the dog on the couch with you with a bone and put a board in front of the dog so that they're not being stared at, so they don't perceive that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of little things that you can try, but usually if the dog is barking and they won't work the bone, um, it's a couple of factors. Make sure you've got something like spam in that bone. Make sure you've got something high, high value and that it's easy to get. It's easy to get out. And if they still won't work it, just get further distance with them and, and work it at a lower intensity, right? So maybe you can't do the family reunion. Maybe you need to do some work with them of go to a friend, sit on the porch with one person and give them a bone. Not the person, the dog. <laughs> that. I'm yeah. glad you clarified that, Joan. <laughs> yeah, 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 I just wanted to clarify on that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, 
So in the case where someone believes um, that they do have separation anxiety, so we're not talking about prevention here, we're talking about um, potentially the di I'm assuming that the dog may have been di diagnosed with separation anxiety, perhaps. What are your suggestions for what do I do now, given the dog has had this problem for six years? Um, again, um, you know, you can always do the work. Uh, and I know, I think I did see somebody else asked a little bit about, about the idea of using meds, um, you know, and I think that that goes part and parcel with that. So. Where you have a dog, if the dog's have issues, um, especially if it's a separation issue or an anxiety-based issue, if it's something that's been going on for that long, um, not, the first thing I'd be doing is talking with the vet about let's get some meds on board, um, let's see if we can help them. And the idea of the medication is hard. We tend to get very hung up on meds. Uh, we really give them a whole lot of uh, power and a whole lot of meaning that they don't actually have. So. You know, the reality is if the dog had a heart problem, you would put them on pills. So if I can help a dog, if I, just like your friends, I promise you, um, at least two, you know, at least half your friends are probably on anti-anxiety meds right now as we speak. So, and that's what's keeping you from being friends, see? So now you all like each other, right? Um, but I mean, a dog like that, if you're talking about long term, um, yeah, I do think that would be something we'd be looking at using meds. And then it's a slower process, which may take, it's too much time to go into here. But it is a slower, we do micro hits. So it's similar to the idea of having the gate up and having, doing very, very small repetitions. If I'm leaving them back, it's the same principle. But it does sound like that dog, there are, there are a few more techniques that we might add in there um, with a dog like that. But I would be looking at medication. I'd be looking at pheromones and some different techniques, working one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks, Joan. Um, are the PC meatballs that you referred to pre-cooked or do they require cooking? I'm la no, I'm laughing at this um, because I, I know I look like a domestic goddess, which I'm not. So um, <laughs> they are most certainly pre-cooked. Um, I didn't even know they came not cooked until one day I drove into Toronto in the summer and I found out that I, oh God, it was horrible. So yes, those are already cooked. All you do is thaw and go, and you're good to go. So just let them thaw, and you're good to go. And that's why I said, yeah, make sure you don't give it to them frozen. Um, I would think that could be pretty dangerous. But, the, yeah, they're great. You just simply let a few of them thaw, a few of them out when you're going to be training. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Please repeat the name of the purple treat thing. The purple clam. I love the purple clam. The purple clam, it's... it's um, I know this answer. It's called the twist and treat. It's a busy buddy. I'm going to make sure. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll double check it for you, but I think, yeah, it's called the twist and treat. I think if the presentation is saved with you, um, the name is there and I, and I will make sure, um, you know, I just want, I'm going to make sure I am telling you the right thing. Um, but yeah, it's called the twist and treat. Make sure I have that for you. Great, thank you. So just a reminder to everyone, if you do have questions, please do type them in the chat um, while we continue through the questions that you've already submitted, which is awesome. Um, our next question uh, would be, um, we had limited success with behavioral interventions for destructive separation anxiety. Um, we've had 100% response to clomipramine, clomicom. Is clomicom a lifelong treatment? Um, yeah, the standard line that I use for that is, um, you know, the crystal ball consult is several thousand dollars. And so very few people can afford the crystal ball. Um, I don't know. And that's because when we look at dogs' brain, the brain chemistry, uh, the dog's brain chemistry is very, very similar to ours. Um, so we do see a lot of very similar, even like mental illness stuff with dogs that we see in people. I've seen bipolar, in fact, I often talk about that. I had a client at one point with a beagle um, that was almost clearly a bipolar um, disorder where the dog would just cycle through several weeks. So in answer to the question about the clomicom, 
Um, a, if it's helping, that's terrific. So I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, it may be that if you're doing the work now that you were given from the trainer with the behavior, the separation anxiety, now that he's on the home call, now the point of using meds, as I said before, it's sometimes it's just to facilitate the training so that the dog can benefit. So it may well be if you really go back and now do the work that you were doing before with your behaviorist um, while you have the Clomacom on board, you may find that you can start to phase that down and that they're still doing well. Uh, but don't be discouraged if you phase down and they don't, don't be discouraged. Again, it's just like your friends or your relatives. There are some people who they will be on, uh, you know, anti-anxiety medication or some sort of thing their whole lives, it gives them a better quality of life. It's not a detriment to the person. Uh, we have a little bit of a theme going here, which which isn't actually related to separation anxiety, but I suppose it could be um, related to socialization in the sense that uh, we have a couple of our guests who are having difficulty with uh, puppy nipping and biting behavior when excited, playing, or greeting. Um, do you have any comments that would help for them and that particular behavior? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm pausing just because that's about, yeah, about 14 different subjects you've given me there. So, yeah, we will just hang out for another hour and a half, I guess. So, no, um, so basically the quick, the quick synopsis with the puppy biting or the, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of that's about simply managing the situation. The best answer and the short answer to that is you know, if you have a puppy who's doing a lot of biting, ideally we do a lot of work with tethers. Because the best way for me to handle that is to be able to calmly disengage, to move away. So, uh, you know, if I've got my, if my puppy is doing a lot of biting or mouthing, ideally, I want to simply be able to go out on you lose and move away. Um, please, for the love of God and all things good, please do not yell out. Uh, you sometimes hear trainers recommending that, like if the puppy is nippy. They tell you to, you know, yell out or something like that. Um, oh, my Lord, please don't do that. You've just become a squeaky toy. You are absolutely going to reinforce the behavior, right? So don't become fun. Um, with biting and that sort of thing, one of the answers also when they say, well, he's jumping on guests or biting with guests. Uh, and without, you know, I'm not trying to be a jerk. Uh, you know, I'm a lovely person, really. Trust me, I am. Um, but sort of our answer is always, but how is that happening? In other words, like go back to the section on the guest. If you have a puppy who tends to be bitey and jumpy, then again, make sure they're put away before the guests come in. And so once the people are seated, that's much easier for the puppy to handle um, rather than all the stimulation of somebody coming in and out. Um, and then it lets you bring the dog out on leash. So now you're in a position to do some treat scatter, reward the dog when they're making good choices but it lets you just gently interrupt if they start jumping, biting. So a lot of the biting work is more preventative and always make sure that you do have a, at least like three or four appropriate chew items on the floor all the time. Um, you often hear about rotating toys, that you should pick toys up and rotate them, and that's fine. Sure, you, that helps to keep them novel, but do always make sure you've got some chew, appropriate chew stuff always have that easily available so you can keep catching and rewarding. Um, in a scenario where a dog is in a backyard, um, he can't see other dogs, but he can hear them and starts barking, uh, what is your recommendation on how to handle that? So the backyard one, um, again, that's your barrier frustration. So there's twofold. Is you know, it depends um, where that dog is. So first, if it's a neighboring dog, if it's somebody you like, we often recommend is, you know, make a, talk to the neighbors if you get along well with them. Um, some people we say, do a schedule. Say to them, look, I'll put my guy out from two to four, you put yours out from four to six. So that way you're not triggering it. Um, if it's a dog in the neighborhood, a random one that barks, then I would suggest going back to a little bit of, you may have to leave a long line, like a long thin leash on the dog outside. Um, 
or sit out there with the dog tethered to you so that any time you do hear the bark, you're able to do some of the treat toss. Um, but with barking in the backyard, if they do bark, what we recommend is calmly, um, but just very quickly, just bring the dog in the house. So if you can really time that well, so that when the dog, if the dog barks in the yard, and I've gone through this recently because we moved and we have a porch and I like sitting on the porch, um, but that means we have people walking by. So I've had to go through all of this work with my own dogs as well. Um, yeah, and so they really know, Louis absolutely gets the one bark is you lose the porch, go in the house please. So again, and that's the same thing with the yard, it's both. It's do the work of go out there with the bones, go out there with meals, so they're not learning to go out and look for that dog or listen for the bark. And it's also about calmly interrupting really quickly if they do bark, one bark, and go in the house calmly, and you're done, you lose the yard if you bark. Um, is there a concern when you have a dog that's barking that you feed them that it will encourage the actual barking to continue. So you're actually rewarding them for the barking. Right, um, yeah, so what you're asking me about, this is the timing, um, and this is getting into some of the psychology work. So um, again, it's sort of the manual. So basically, when we talk about barking, there's different types of barking. And so when you have dogs, when you think about that really fast barking, they hear something that like, whoa, 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 with that really quick, fast barking those bursts, that's almost involuntary. So though, that's not the dog standing making a choice. That's a fear bark, it's a panic, it's a quick reaction. So those are the ones you still can do some treat toss on it if you think you can get them back. When you have the dog doing more of the one-off or spaced out barking, maybe they're barking at you, or they're out in the backyard, they're like, cool, someone's there, bark, 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 where are they, right? Those are the ones, no, we don't use food to interrupt. Um, that, those are the ones where you just want to really quickly, calmly redirect, go on in the house. So in other words, we don't use food. And it's the same thing that we talk about. If you tell your dog to be quiet, if they're barking, if you say quiet and they stop barking, you never feed them. We never use food. You may praise them. So if my dog was barking, which he was earlier, if I had said, you know, enough, thank you and she stops, I would praise her, good girl, then I have to redirect her. Then I'm gonna take her out of that room um, and I can give treats later. But yeah, the, what they're asking about in that question is a nuance of, it's what type of a bark am I dealing with is going to be the answer to that question. If it's a fear-based, fast panic, you can still try to use food. If it's a more spaced out where they're, they're making more of a choice, no, we don't use food, we want to interrupt, but try and get better at catching them earlier. Toss food before they bark. When you see them alert, when you see that little head go up and the mouth close and the ears up, that's your moment to do the toss before they bark. That's how you'll start to get them reacting when they hear a sound instead of barking, turning back to you. So just to tie in to the barking question, so then how do you handle the set up where you have one dog alert and then there's a multiple dog household and all of the rest of the dogs alert. <laughs> yeah, we've lived that. We've lived that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I have that here. You know, I love Atomic Betty dearly, um, but she's an alarm barker, you know, and I could cheerfully throttle her sometimes. Yes, you. I'm talking about you. Um, but yeah, so basically, and that's why I said to you in the very beginning, always wear food. That's exactly what we do in our house. The moment if one dog barks, immediately off, just give a treat to the other dogs. If you can't toss it, if it's not safe to toss treats because there's multiple dogs and you don't want to take a chance of a fight, you can still praise and hand a treat, hand a small treat to each one. But that's really important in a multi-dog house. As, the moment one dog barks, immediately as fast as you can, feed the other dogs, then deal with your barker. And that's exactly what we've gone through here. Yeah, that's, that's how you get them so they don't start learning to feed off that, because they will. It's not that the barker dog is gonna learn to be quiet and polite. It goes the other way. They don't learn the good behaviors. They all learn the bad behaviors from each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, along the same theme, if you throw food to the dog when someone comes to the door while the dog is barking, will the dog associate the food to his barking as opposed to someone coming to the door? 
Um, so it's, again, it's, you know, you're asking me a question that it would be helpful for me to see the dog. So the short answer, again, um, is, you know, again, without being a jerk, but what, sort of, why is the dog at the door barking? So in other words, two things you want to get better at. Um, if you know someone's coming, you're asking them, give me a heads up when you're about 10 or 15 minutes out so I can plan. It's like we said before about plan ahead. So you can get ready. So I know they're coming. Fine. I will sit, you know, especially there's two of us. You know, you can deal with the door. I'll go sit on the couch. I'll put the leash on the dog, tie him to me so I can do the treat work on the couch. Um, when the person comes in, you can still do a treat scatter initially to interrupt the barking. But once you've done the scatter and they pause, you have to then move the dog out of the situation so they don't begin to rebark. That's where I think it becomes more of an issue. I don't think in and of itself um, on that initial hit that you're going to create a reward for barking because what you're going to see by doing that behavior is you're going to see them run to the door. And we see this with our clients when we work on it is they start, they may do one or two barks, but you'll see them check you because they're going to learn to start looking for that food. And so when they start to do that, where they're like, I bu wait, there's someone there. Do I get paid? Yes, you do get paid. Here, sweetheart, come on, let's go over here. Now you have their brain. Now you're starting to get their brain. So in answer to your question, A, ideally, I don't want to necessarily toss food if the dog's barking, um, unless, like I said, if it's the very beginning of my work, um, if I think I can get them to eat. But like I said, your time that you really want to react you really want to get better at catching the alert, even when that person pulled in the driveway. Um, my guess is you probably got a sense. You saw your dog alert. They kind of got that head up. They heard something. That's when you're doing food tossing. You're trying not to wait until they're already barking. Um, and again, you know, you'll screw this up. Don't worry. We're normal people, right? We make mistakes. It happens. So um, just get out of the situation. But normally, yeah, you can still do some toss in the very beginning to try and reboot them. Thanks. So if the dog, or at what point should someone become concerned uh, that their dog might have separation anxiety? So is a little bit of whining and crying at the door okay? Or at what point does it become something that they should be concerned and say, I, I need to seek help for this? You know, one of the best tools that I often recommend is use webcams um, because it is hard, especially with separation. There are many times where I just simply don't have the information because we don't know what's going on. So I think the webcam is your best tool. If you're not sure um, about the dog, it is exactly, it's sort of the intensity of the behavior, what's going on, um, and it's their well-being, right? So in other words, if you leave them, and that's why we use the food, if you go out, uh, and you leave them with uh, uh, spam, with steak, with meatballs, with stuff like that, and they don't eat it or they, they don't touch it until you come home, that's, that's an anxiety. There's some anxiety there. So that's telling you there is some, you know, and it may not be debilitating. It may not be terrible. They may be functional. But, it, yeah, that's very, that's a really quick indicator. If they'll eat when you get home and they won't eat when you're gone, that's often a bit of anxiety. Um, but, again, it's sort of the are they able to cope? So if you put the, the webcam on, um, how much distress are you seeing? Because that's what you really need to know when we look at anxiety. So is it something where they're whining, but then they'll just, after a moment or two, they're like, fine, I'm going to go eat the ball. I hate you, and I'm going to go curl up on the couch. And they sleep, and they settle, then you're probably okay. Um, if it's something where you're seeing a lot of panting, a lot of pacing, if they keep going back and forth, if they can't settle, then we say, yeah, that looks like there may be some more significant anxiety. It really is a quality of life. Um, and it's how much distress or do you think you're seeing at that time? Can they settle? And like I say, that's where the webcam will be one of your best friends to give you more information about what it is you're looking at and to give the behaviorist or your trainer or the consultant the information as well. So around the webcam, Joan, um, do you have a preference? So for example, there's the just visual where they're documenting what's happening and then you have products like Furbo, which throw treats and talk. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, um, I kind of have, I have mixed feelings 
about the firm. I'm sorry, I just I laugh at the firm because I've always said the same thing. If I have a two-way camera, trust me, mine is like, stop that, right? Get over here, stop it. I'm not, oh, I'm not, get over here where I can see you. What are you doing? So mine would probably not be that good. I'd be trying to hit him in the eye with the treats. Um, but for the webcam, again, my, I, I think that can go either way because of the individuals. I've had dogs who have done really well with the, the treat dispense, the remote treat dispensing where the owners could talk to them. I've had a couple of clients with dogs did really well, just simply, I think one of them, the owner said, you know, basically was sort of, they left, they said, you're fine, you're all right, stop. And the dog was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm fine. I, I had another owner where hearing the dog, or hearing the, or another owner, had another dog that when they heard the owner, it, it, it ramped up the anxiety. They ended up getting rid of the camera. It, was, it just ended up making it much worse, and the dog did much better just by using a regular webcam that the people could see what was going on. So again, because the real key on that is you're at, it's sort of a twofold question. Um, the point on the webcam is to get a clearer picture of what's going on with the dog. It's less about interacting at that moment. It's to give me clarity about the quality of life and the level of distress. So again, if it's something, and that's when you go back on that separation slide, if it's something where they whine and they're like, well, screw it. I guess I'll get the garbage out then. Then that may not be an anxiety dog, right? But if it's something where you're really seeing either significant um, damage, especially around the doorways or um, significant pacing or warning signs, then that's something that says, let's look at that. That's a more severe anxiety. That's a more complex issue. So when you're talking about knowing the threshold for your dog, you mentioned about uh, not taking food as a sign that you've gone beyond the threshold. Are there any indicators that you would look for prior to them stopping eating? Yeah, um, there's a few. So when we talk about that threshold, especially, in, and it's really especially when you are dealing with what we call reactivity or dogs that may bark at things on leash, um, one of the first ones with the food is um, is how they're taking the food. So I often say in the thing that that's this is an abbreviated version of my regular work um, is how are they taking the food? Are they taking it easily? So one of the early warning signs is if they start to really snatch the food, they start taking it hard, um, or if they um, or if they're spitting it out. That's another indicator. Um, another really important indicator as well for stress level is, uh, I often say, is will they do a simple command? So if, you're, if you think your dog knows sit and you call them and you say sit when you're outside and they don't sit, that's another indicator that says, that says to you, you're over their head. I need to get out. They're starting to fail. So those are some of the early checkpoints that we look at. It's sort of how are they taking the food? Um, if they are taking it, are they grabbing it? Are they snatching it? Are they taking it appropriately? Um, and like I said, can they do easy commands? So even if they bark, if I can call the dog and say, enough, sit, and the dog sits, that means you still have them. You can work with that dog. So now I can ask the dog for sit. I can expect a little more. Um, question around threshold. There's a couple of them here. Um, one in relation to being terrified and not moving and the other uh, from the perspective of, you know, um, reacting, you know, as soon as you go outside the door. How do you recommend people work on things where they can't seem to get enough distance between the dog and the thing that they're not socialized with or to? So one of the things they may you may want to try, I have in the manual I call it um, I call it the breakfast hall um, for dogs like that um, that either they're reactive from the get-go the moment the door opens they're already in a really aroused state they're already really electric or my really scared guys who when they go out they're just terrified as soon as they start to go to the uh, stop as soon as they start to step outside they're really afraid um, so all breakfast hall is is exactly sort of what it sounds like, which is basically you you put the leash on the dog to keep them safe, um, but you feed them a meal or breakfast, open the front door of the house or open the screen door um, and feed them just inside the hallway. Feed them in your front foyer, feed them in the front hall. And so that's sort of a graded way to begin exposure 
to the outside world. So if I can't get the dog outside comfortably, then the starting point would be I'd feed more meals with the door open at a distance where they can hear the things outside but it's much more dilute. And then you would move up with dogs like that. We would, I would recommend a lot of work of just simply take them out front, feed them on the front porch, and bring them back in the house. Um, just because again, a lot of that behavior on both ends is expectation. So in other words, when you get dogs that are reacting to that degree either way, uh, that often means now they're anticipating. So they know as soon as they go out, it's now either going to be, oh, my God, look for things to bark at. Or for my little scared one, it's like, oh, God, what's going to happen? I'm definitely going to die. Today will be the day I die. So in both cases, I want to do more reps of simply eat your meal, come back in, nothing happened. So those would be dogs I'd really ramp up that sort of work. And again, if they can't eat a meal just right outside the front door, then do the breakfast hall. Then start by making sure that it's secure and safe feed the meals with the doors open in the hallway far enough back where they can begin to work to get them used to those sounds and the, and the things outside. What are your thoughts around um, homeopathic remedies such as uh, rescue remedy or those types of products and their effectiveness in helping with separation anxiety or um, under socialization? Yeah. Um, I'm open, uh, you know, I, I have, again, I've got no issue. I'm very open to any of the homeopathic or the alternative medicines. I've used some of them in different situations. Um, to be very candid, I'm not a huge, the reason I don't recommend them a lot is just simply I don't have enough science on them. It's not that I don't like them one way or the other. I'll be honest, a rescue remedy, I have absolutely never found any client with a dog that was helped by rescue remedy. I've just, it just, I've never had anybody who's vouched for that. So. Um, but some of the ones that do that do have some efficacy that have been tested, um, lavender oil is one. Um, we have some, I call the chow ladies, very nice uh, students or wonderful people. Um, and they've used the, they would use a couple of drops and what they would do with it is they would rub it um, just on the ear flap. And then on the underside, the dog's chest, they had a dog that had issues really around Halloween with people coming to the door and very, very fearful. So. And they found that the lavender oil really seemed to help that dog to settle. Um, and there's also been studies as well that corroborate that, that. So lavender oil, that may be something you can look at if you want to look more at a homeopathic or holistic approach. Um, chamomile is another one that has been shown to be, have some effectiveness around anxiety issues. Okay. Um... When you have a situation where a dog is more attached to one person in the family than everyone else, and I guess everybody's been staying home, is it advantageous to try and transfer some of that um, uh, interest onto other family members? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, I mean, sort of a, it, it's, it's a hard one to say without, without seeing the dog. Um, you know, you very often do see, especially with rescue, and certainly, as you know, even better than I do on this one, Heather, uh, that many times a rescue or an adopted dog, they very often will connect strongly with one person initially. And it doesn't mean that they don't love the other people in the family. So I think the answer to that person, to that question, is less about how the dog relates to them. It's more about, A, how how is the quality of the relationship that the dog has with the other family members? Um, and what is the quality of life issue when that person is not around? So in other words, the dog may be extremely attached to mom, but as long as it will still play, it seems to really like the other people, will it spend any time with the other people in the family, um, then it may be okay. Um, again, same thing, when mom goes out, uh, is the dog functional? Will the dog settle or, you know, does the dog not function? Is it anxious? So. That's, there's some a lot of bigger questions within that. So in and of itself, absolutely it makes sense for all the family members to try and do different things with the dog. So sure, you might have, if the dog is really attached to one person, then we might let the other people do more feeding um, or the other ones do more play, play with the dog or um, you know things like that. Um, but I think it really depends on the dog. It depends on the quality of life. Um, you know, as long as the dog is happy 
and as long as the dog, if you go out, you know, we often see this with some rescues, you know, we often laugh, we say to the, the person who they're attached to, go away for two weeks and just leave them with the other person at home. And very often you get the dog, it's like, oh, well, crap, I guess you're my person now. But they often end up with a great relationship. So it really depends on the quality of life of that dog. Um, it's okay for a rescue to connect strongly to somebody as long as they are not suffering or they're not uh, anxious or, you know, to the detriment of other people. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I think we're pretty much out of time for questions, Joan. And again, I thank you so much. It's been amazing. Uh, I think we are all taking away some great information that we're going to be able to apply to our dogs at home. Uh, we've got a better idea of how to work on socialization and um, how to deal with potential prevention of separation and anxiety. So that was um, awesome. And we thank you so much uh, for your time and for your knowledge. Thanks, we have, uh, yeah. sorry? No, 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 go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna say thank you very much also, you know, I really appreciate you having me and thank you very much for the, you know, and I, I'll try very quickly touch on a few things if you want with the chat, if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate all your time and thank you very much for, for staying with me. And thank you. So everyone, we have other free, fun virtual activities this week as well, virtual tours, visit our nail trim tutorials, and our second round of Guess the Dog Breed is coming up. You can find more details at omhs.ca forward slash mission possible, all one word. We love the work that we do here at the Oaks and Milton Humane Society. We love knowing that vulnerable animals in our community will continue to receive the love, compassion, and care that is provided by the team here and made possible by all of you. If you've enjoyed tonight's session, we hope you will consider making a donation to the OMHS. Your gift can be made at online at omhs.ca forward slash donate now. Thanks everybody. Stay safe and enjoy your evening.